All right. So, um, so I was talking about fission product yield measurements, and the last uh, part of the last lecture had to do with mass, um, low mass resolution, high efficiency measurements. And now I'm going to switch gear and talk about the uh, more high uh, mass resolution, but more lower efficiency measurements that we do as sort of a complementary techniques uh, technique to the ionization chambers. Um, so Stefan mentioned uh, 2E, 2V types of instruments yesterday, I think, and, and uh, he talked about, uh, I know he did talk about Longren, which is a mass spectrometer for fission fragments. Uh, and then there's the cosi fantote spectrometer that was developed also back in the 80s uh, that is different. It doesn't use a magnet. It was a 2E, 2V method. Um, so a few years ago, we proposed um, building um, this, one of these 2E, 2V instruments, very similar to um, the cosi fantote spectrometer. Um, and there's been several other uh, instrument, um, spectrometers of the same type being built, uh, and we tried to replicate this technique. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, the ionization chambers have something like four or five mass unit resolution, and the, the 2E, 2V method has been shown with cosi fantote, for example, in the past, to achieve more like one mass unit resolution for the light fragments, and somewhat worse for heavy fission fragments. So this is the spider spectrometer, um, the way it's uh, currently installed in Los Alamos. Um, it consists of, let's see here. Yeah. so it consists of a sample, actinide sample in the center. This is a vacuum chamber. The neutron beam goes through and induces fission in a thin sample. Uh, so you emit both of the fission fragments, and then there's a time of flight section here. So you have fast timing pickoffs. You measure the velocity of fission fragments, in this case, over about 70 centimeters or so. And then at the end, we have ionization chambers where you measure the kinetic energy of the fission fragment. So if you combine uh, time of flight with energy measurements, then you get the mass of the fragments. Um, so, um, in order to get to about one mass unit resolution, there are some requirements on the time of flight and energy measurements. So, you need to get um, to about 1% or so, or half a percent, both on uh, velocity and uh, the energy in order to achieve that. Um, so, if you look at how what you need to get to the mass resolution, you have to have good energy resolution of the fragments, good timing resolution, and you also need to know your flight path length. If you do a uh, flight, um, time of flight measurement over 70 centimeters or so, uh, and you have to, to account for the different emission angles, you need some position sensitivity if you have a large efficiency instrument so you know your flight path length on an event-by-event -event basis. So this instrument, uh, was set up for both the time of flight, energy measurements, and then also position information uh, for the fission fragments. Um, and the instrument was also designed to measure radioactive isotopes, so plutonium-239, for example. Um, so we had to come up with a design where we could ha safely handle thin samples of radioactive material. If you have a carbon backing, um, you want to be careful not to break it and lose the plutonium somewhere in your room. So we designed a certain mechanism that allows us to encapsulate the plutonium, put it into the vacuum chamber, um, and then expose the sample to beam. Um, as I said, this is under vacuum. You have to have a fairly good vacuum for the um, timing detectors to work well. And then there uh, is a window that the fragment passes through to get into the ionization chamber that is uh, at pressure. So another difficulty in building one of these is to have a very thin window so that you have minimal energy loss and uh, uh, you uh, achieve enough resolution or you know, have enough, um, as little energy straggling as possible. So with the cosi fantote spectrometer, they used stretch mylar for thin windows. 
Um, we wanted to go to higher angular acceptance and then uh, stretch mylar had some issues. The, the thickness of the mylar windows might uh, vary across the surface. So we went to a different type of uh, window and I will show you what that is here in a little bit. Um, so the time of flight detectors uh, are uh, of a standard type that again was used in, in the old systems. Um, it's based on microchannel plates. Um, and what you have is an electrostatic mirror. So as fission fragment goes through these detectors, uh, they pass through a carbon film in the back of this detector. And the fragment passes through with minimal energy loss. Um, but as they go through these carbon films, secondary electrons are emitted and they are bent down using electrostatic mirrors here down to MCPs at the bottom and that gives you a very fast timestamp. Um, another difficult thing here was that we wanted, as I said, go to, to go to large um, angular acceptance. So we had to go to fairly large microchannel plates which typically worsens your resolution. So in other systems where they had uh, MCPs of two or four centimeter, centimeter diameter, these are uh, seven and a half centimeter in diameter MCPs. Um, and then in order to get position resolution to, to calculate the flight path length, we have this uh, position sensitivity. So the microchannel plates sits on the ley line anodes. So these are just um, wires uh, in, um, in X and Y position. And by measuring the time delay from where the electrons hit until you read out your signals. Uh, if you look at the two time delays, you get an XY position of your hit, so you know where you, the electrons hit on the microchannel plate. Uh, and this is just the uh, time of flight assembly going into the vacuum chamber. Um, these MC, uh, or the delay nanos were made by uh, Rontec in Germany. Um, and they can get very high uh, position resolution in, this, in the way that we are using them uh, with electrostatic mirrors we can get to a few millimeter resolution um, but for other applications you can do much better than that. Um, so the first thing we needed to look at what the, was the time of flight resolution. That's the difficult part. People know how to optimize the energy resolution for ionization chambers but getting good timing resolution, resolution was really uh, crucial here. Uh, so some of the early tests that we did, again, you saw what the, MC, what the um, timing detector assembly looked like. We put two of them um, at 70 centimeter separation and had an alpha source and let the alpha particles go through um, the two detectors and then just measure um, the time of flight for alpha particles. So we used the source uh, with different alpha lines and looked at their time of flight. And uh, by optimizing the setup um, and uh, using the position information, you can get down, we were able to get down to about 200 picosecond coincidence uh, resolution. So that's uh, uh, 200 picoseconds coincidence, so it means about 150 uh, picoseconds per detector. People have done better than that. It's not clear that you can do better than that with uh, the large MCPs, so that um, is something we will continue to try, but I uh, haven't seen people getting better than that in the past. Um, another thing you want to know is the efficiency. So as I said, we tried to get large angular acceptance, uh, and the whole point is to get high efficiency, uh, and high efficiency in this case means 10 to the minus three efficiency for detecting um, fragments in this, uh, with the angular acceptance that we have per detector arm. So you don't want to lose any more efficiency by uh, missing some of the events. So we studied um, the detector efficiency as a particle goes through um, the electrostatic mirror. You can lose some fragments uh, as they hit wires in the electrostatic mirror. Uh, and you can also lose some events because you don't produce enough um, secondary electrons from the interaction in the foil. Um, so we did a, a measurement where for alpha particles. We had alpha particles going through and then you look at coincidences into a um, surface barrier detector and by looking at the, que the coincidence count rate you can figure out where your efficiency was. Uh, 
and then depending on um, the uh, electric field in the in the electrostatic mirror, um, you need a certain field to start having full efficiency. But then for alpha particles, we got to 70 or 80 percent type of efficiency. We didn't do the same thing for fission fragments, but you expect that efficiency to be higher because you make more secondary electrons uh, with the higher ionizing particle of a fission fragment. Let's see if that works better. Um, and then, uh, so that's the timing detectors, and then we have the ionization detectors that uh, measures the kinetic uh, energy of the fragments. So this was um, developed in collaboration with uh, University of New Mexico, so a university collaborator. Um, so this is just what the ionization chamber looks like. It ends up being a fairly long chamber because we want to run, uh, run at low pressure so that you can have a thin window between the vacuum and the pressurized ionization chamber. Um, and then we want we have these guard rings uh, to make a very uniform field inside the chamber. So um, this was developed at UNAM. They they ran um, some different gases. In this case, they actually ran P10, uh, and what we're running now is isobutane, which gives you better energy resolution and, and a better and a better response. Um, so they did some measurements to look at the energy resolution, and and we. Had, we were able to achieve uh, close to the roughly half percent that you can get to for fission fragments with an ionization chamber. So there were some, some publications uh, back in the 80s where they tried to optimize chambers for, for the cosy fantodia spectrometer at that time. And they got something like 4.4% energy resolution for the light fragments and 0.6.7% for the heavy fragments. And we were uh, getting close to those numbers. But then, as I mentioned, one of the critical points. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So the low pressure is um, is nice because you want to have a very thin window for the fragments to pass from the vacuum into the ionization chamber. So if you have a low pressure in the chamber, you can also have a very thin window. If you want to go to a higher pressure, then you have to have a thicker window, and you lose more energy uh, for the fission fragments. Well, it just means that you have to have a look. Oh, have a look because there's something wrong. With yeah, there's just a moment. Thank you. Run the same uh, field per uh, same, uh, per, per centimeter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Sure. So, you, so the total, you need a higher voltage. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that was a bit of an issue. We had to run at fairly high voltages uh, with this longer chamber. Uh, but that's solvable. Um, so, as I mentioned in the, in, in the past um, incarnations of this type of detector, people used the stretch mylar windows. Um, back in the 90s at the PSI, they started using silicon nitride windows as a very thin alternative to, to mylar. Um, and it turns out that these uh, windows work really well. You can get them as thin as the mylar or, or even thinner and, and even have better properties. So here is um, just a comparison where they, where they tested or looked at the energy loss of the rest energy um, of some ions going through a mylar window and compare that to silicon nitride. I don't actually know if this is a fair comparison because they might be different in terms of micrograms per square centimeter thickness. But uh, more importantly, the silicon nitride windows are more uniform. So when we have the stretch mylar, you can have variation in, in thickness. So you have a variation in energy straggling, whereas the uh, silicon nitride window, you get very uniform windows. So you have the same energy correction to make uh, no matter where you hit. So uh, these are the windows that we uh, had designed. So there's actually an array of indivi individual windows. So there's only something like 50% geometric transmission. So you have a 50% chance of hitting um, the support structure and a 50% chance of going through one of the thin windows. 
Uh, but the thickness here is only 200 nanometers, so they are very thin, so you only lose a few percent of, of the energy of the uh, fission fragment as they go through. So this is kind of a small correction to make in a small straggling uh, energy broadening that occurs. So um, we built the spectrometer. We had one arm, of one spider arm, and measured spontaneous fission of californium-252 to look at the performance of the instrument. Um, so this is so black are data points, and red is the England and Ryder evaluation of the fission product yields from californium-252, spontaneous fission. Um, and uh, so we get a good comparison with the evaluation. And based on these tests, we estimated a resolution. So if you, if you looked at the energy resolution, the velocity resolution, we came up with um, something like one and a half mass unit uh, time of resolution for the light fragments and somewhat worse for the heavy fragments. Um, and again, we're trying to get more towards one mass unit, uh, but that's going to require us to really make use of the position sensitivity of the detector, and that wasn't actually working well in these first tests. So after making, uh, looking at spontaneous fission, we went to the Luan Center uh, at Lance and looked at uh, thermal neutron indu or thermal neutron induced fission, both for uh, uranium-235 in this case and for plutonium-239. Um, so again, we're comparing to the England and Ryder evaluation. And if you compare this to what I was showing for the ionization chambers, you um, when you have several mass unit resolution, you lose some of the structures in the mass peaks. And here, when we have better resolution, um, you sort of follow the same trends as you see in the evaluation. Uh, when you go to the heavy peak, the mass resolution gets worse, more like you know, closer to two mass units. And you can see that for one of these yields here that is in the evaluation, according to the evaluation, is rather high. Uh, but because of resolution and broadening, you measure a lower yield in this case. Um, so this is still uh, being analyzed, uh, and the same thing with the plutonium-239. Actually, I'm just showing the light peak in that case because we haven't really done a careful analysis, so I didn't want to show the full mass distribution. So, um, so the, the two-arm version of Spider is uh, actually right now running at the Luan Center, and we're trying to take, we continue to take data for, for thermal fission. But the whole point uh, of doing this is that we want to measure the change in yields for uh, higher excitation energy or higher neutron energies. And with two arms, you just don't have enough efficiency. As, as I mentioned, 10 to the minus 3 type of efficiency per arm. Um, so if you go to fast neutrons where the cross-section is down at least two orders of magnitude or three orders of magnitude, um, your count rates are going to be very small. So um, the solution to that is just to add detectors, to do a detector array. Um, so uh, a few months ago, we started the process of building a larger version. So instead of having two arms, we want to go to something between six arm pairs and nine arm pairs. Um, so this is the current design. Um, with if you do if you increase the number of arms so in order of magnitude, then you're going to get to one percent efficiency, and then you can actually start uh, um, get reasonable count rates even uh, for fast neutrons. So um, right now we have the the diving helmet design, uh, large spherical chamber. Um, with all the ionization chambers mounted on uh, outside of it. Um, some of my colleagues kind of like this design because it um, looked like a nuclear device. Um, but so there are certain challenges with this. You know, so we're going to have a very large uh, vacuum volume to pump out. And you need to place the start detectors and the sample and some structure in the center. Um, and even worse, um, in order to work on the detectors in the middle, you have to get to them. So right now we have a design with a, sort of this access door on there. So we're going to send graduate students in there uh, to work on this and hopefully not lose any of them inside the chamber. 
but yeah, so, so it's going to be a fairly large chamber, one, uh, over one meter in diameter uh, to get the right uh, flight path length uh, everywhere. Um, another problem is with the, with the uh, geometry that we have, it's going to be hard to, to make use of the full solid angle for each slope detector. Um, so we've been looking at different arrangements to come up with the uh, um, optimal one, but this is, this is the current design. So for now, we're just acquired all the internal components, the detector components, and we're still working on the vacuum chamber design. Uh, interestingly enough, this is going to end up being almost as expensive as the TPC. I mean, the TPC was kind of an expensive instrument because of the electronics. This becomes expensive because of the mechanical design of doing all these um, different custom components and the large vacuum chamber. All right, so that was everything I had about uh, fish and product yields. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to sort of go back to the initiation chamber work and talk about total kinetic energy release in fission. Um, so as you now know, most of the energy release in fission is in the form of um, kinetic energy of the fission fragments. Um, and that has been well measured in the, um, the amount of TK has been well measured in the past, but how much um, that um, kinetic energy changes as a function of incident neutron energy was less well known. In fact, up until the MBF uh, 6 evaluation, it was um, in the data library, it was assumed that the uh, total kinetic energy release in fission of the actinides was independent of incident neutron energy, which we've known for a long time is not true, but that's what was in the evaluation. So uh, Madland uh, had a paper from uh, 2006 where he looked at the existing data and made some fits to the data. I don't really want to call it the model, but it's more like a, a data fitting exercise. So he looked at the data, fitted it. Obviously, uh, it was pretty clear that the TKE um, gets lower as you increase the incident neutron energy. And uh, the data that he used for most actin for the major actinides, typically, so for uranium-238, there was data up to um, 100 MeV or so. But for plutonium-239 and uranium-235, the data sets only went up to 5 or 9 MeV, at least the stuff that he found. So he recommended that we make some more measurements and extend this range up at least until 30 MeV. And I think the 30 MeV came from the fact that you want to know TK at 14 MeV. So if you go twice as far uh, and have a consistent measurement over that range, you, you get some confidence in the, that you get the right answer at, at 14 MeV. So again, we use this uh, fresh gridded ionization chambers. Um, the one in the picture and the one we used actually is from Gale, so Stefan's or, or uh, George's chamber. So they were nice enough to bring it to Los Alamos and also bring a uranium-238 sample on thin backings. Um, the Gale group is really uh, good at making nice fission targets. Um, so this is the uh, interior of the chamber sitting in one of our glove boxes. So in this case, we actually mounted, I think this is the uranium-235 um, sample that we put in there. So this is you know, the same cartoon. You, you've seen the cartoon before. So you have the central cathode with the sample. Um, this here is the uh, Frisch grids. And under there is the anode and the nanode. Um, so back in 2012, we did uh, uranium-238 measurements to look at um, both the mass yields but also the TK. And that was done together with uh, uh, collaborators from Gale, so they came out to, to uh, Lance and, and did measurements with us there. Um, and that was really a cool measurement, so we decided next year to do uranium-235, and then the year after that, plutonium-239. We could have probably done 239 in, in 2013, um, but those uh, thin backings with plutonium is kind of scary, and I get the shakes every time I try to put them in the detector, so I've broken quite a few of them. That's always very popular with our uh, health um, radiation protection people. Especially since there are car so we use carbon backings and they flake. So when they break, you get a million flakes of uh, plutonium stuff everywhere. Um, so anyway, so in over three years, we did measurements of these three isotopes. 
And uh, in the first measurement with 238, this is what we see. So as I mentioned, 238, there was already measurements going out to high energies, 200 MeV or so. And this was uh, work by Solar that was also done at Los Alamos, but back in the, I think it was the late 80s and early 90s. So what this plot is showing is, um, so I think the solar data, yeah, so the solar data is on here, but it's kind of hard to tell. And then the red line is the fit uh, that uh, Madland did to the solar data to show that it's, you know, the TK is decreasing out to higher energies. Um, and then uh, John Lestone at Los Alamos did some uh, more detailed modeling and, and tried to understand uh, not only how uh, this behaves if you make a fit, but try to, to sort of model the fission process. Uh, and then he get this purple curve where you see structure in the TK energy dependence that occurs at multi-chance fission. Excuse me. Um, and then um, the, the larger black points here are a measurement that agrees very well with the, with the less stone prediction. Now I can drop the mic at the end of this. That's be, that'd be good. All right. So then the next measurement we did was for uranium-235. And it turns out that there's, um, there's been some, um, some type of experiment evidence in the past that the TK not only decreases with increasing excitation energy or, or neutron energy, but also that there is a drop-off if you go below 1 MeV and that the TK sort of uh, turns over again and, and uh, had, um, is reduced. So again, the fit here is Madeline's fit in that in for unit 235 was data out to 9 MeV, so that's what he fitted. Uh, and then Les Stone in purple made his prediction. In the black are measurements that are again in very good agreement with, with the Les Stone measurement. And in fact, we do see this turnover uh, quite nicely below 1 MeV, so that really did confirm what people had sort of seen before but didn't really have full um, confidence in it. And actually, after we made these measurements and uh, Arnie Sirk, who was doing some of the fission modeling, uh, tried to model the TK, he uh, made some predictions. And was, he was, first of all, able to reproduce this turnover for uranium-235 um, and predicted that it will happen in uranium-233 as well. So we are interested in measuring uh, uranium-233 and see if we observe the same behavior for that isotope. Uh, and then the most recent result uh, is for plutonium-239. So that was the last measurement we made. And uh, this is actually just about to get published. Uh, in this case, there was only data, or at least only data being used in the evaluation that we extended out to 5 MeV. Um, so you, see, you might see a red line here, which is the fit to the data out to 5 MeV. And again, less than prediction. Uh, and in this case, we have reasonable agreement with Les Stone. For some reason, we see an enhancement uh, in the TK uh, below second chance fission. So it's, uh, I have a little bit of a hard time understanding why that would be, but uh, that's what we exp see experimentally. Um, of course, the important point is going to be, or, or is, the 14 MeV cross section. So 14 MeV is important for applications. Um, and um, as I said, in the past, in the evaluation, you assumed a flat TK out high energy, so you were overestimating what it, is, what it was at 14 MeV. <coughs> After that, people said, okay, so clearly that's, that's too high a value. So what they did is they took Madeline's evaluation or, or fit, 
And in his paper, Madeline said, okay, so this is only valid in the energy range that I'm fitting to, so don't extrapolate using this value. So you can imagine what the evaluators did. They extrapolated down to 14 MeV, of course. So doing, in doing so, they came up with too low of a TK value at 14 MeV. So these new measurements um, should fix that problem and give you a more reasonable value for the 14 MeV TK point. All right, so that's all I had to say about fission, finally. So now I'm going to move over to uh, talk a little bit about neutron capture measurements being done at the Lewin Center at LANS. Um, so there are different reasons to measure neutron, neutron capture. Uh, a lot of the work we do is motivated by nuclear astrophysics, um, but there's also some interest from uh, nuclear energy programs to do neutron capture measurements. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, if you, know, you have a breeder reactor, neutron capture is actually what's making um, some of the, the fuel that you get. Uh, and even in a tra traditional reactor, you're building up significant amounts of plutonium-239. And a lot of the energy uh, towards the end of a fuel cycle actually comes from plutonium. And that happens through neutron capture on uranium-238. So I'm not really from the nuclear astrophysics um, background. So I'm not going to talk much about this. But as I mentioned, many of the neutron capture measurements we want to do really uh, is to understand the uh, synthesis of, of heavier elements in the universe. Um, and um, there's been many proposals at Los Alamos to use uh, our neutron capture capabilities to measure different uh, reactions of nuclear astrophysical importance. Uh, most of it is for the S, nuclear astrophysical S process. Um, there are uh, limits on how short-lived isotopes you can do uh, capture measurements on. So what you can do at Los Alamos is mostly uh, related to the S process, uh, and you can't really do very short-lived targets to, with our current capabilities. So at the Luan Center, we have the DANCE detector, detector for advanced neutron capture experiments. So this is a, a calorimeter. It has 160 barium fluoride crystals, um, and it was really designed for radioactive targets for things going down to sort of 100 uh, day half-lives. And it allows you to measure the full gamma ray energy in, in a capture event, as well as look at the multiplicity of gamma rays. The nice thing in, in using that technique is that you can uh, identify, or you, you, app, you identify which isotopes you did capture on by looking at the Q value. So even if you have a mixed target, uh, you can pull out which isotope captured in, in the event by event um, approach. Um, so these are the crystals. So here's the uh, neutron beam coming in. You place the target here in the center. And then you have the uh, scintillating crystals in different, that have the different um, um, geometries to cover all close to the full 4 <coughs> pi. Um, there's also a, a lithium hydride sphere that uh, reduces some of the background by absorbing some of the scattered neutrons. And when you want to do capture on things that have large fission cross-sections, we also have a PPAC detector that uh, triggers on fission and allows you to distinguish between fission gamma rays and capture gamma rays. So this fission uh, tagger was added uh, about five years ago or so, and that really su helped support our um, nuclear energy motivated measurements. We want to do capture on things like uranium-235 and other fissile isotopes. So uh, this is a fairly straightforward PPAC design. So you have, in this case, plutonium-239 um, in the detector. And with the PPAC, you run it, run it very low pressures. So you have very little material in the beam to scatter neutrons from. So it uh, works really well for what you want to do uh, with the dance detector. Now, one of the problems is that uh, this PPAC is not 100% efficient. So sometimes you actually have fission and fission gamma rays, but you don't really know that from the PPAC fission tagger. So instead what you do is that you uh, look at the times where you have a fission trigger 
and you see the characteristics of the fission gamma rays. So the multiplicity and total energies are fairly different compared to neutron capture. For example, the multiplicity is quite a bit higher. So you look at the gamma ray or the dance response for fission and use that shape to uh, subtract off background in the neutron capture spectrum. Um, so here's just some, some um, comparison to the uh, traditional way of using C, oops, C6, D6. Detectors. So, um, so the, those detectors are very nice because they're very insensitive to neutrons, but you don't get the energy information. So that's the advantage of, of using uh, a detector like Dance, where you can really just um, distinguish which isotope you captured on. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's just a different technique. It has some advantages and disadvantages. Um, So one of the measurements, the early measurements that were done for, for um, nuclear energy programs was uranium-235. And there were some large discrepancies in the evaluation out in the um, sort of KV region where it gets very difficult to measure. For one reason, um, one of the reasons that it's difficult to measure is that the capture cross-section drops off very quickly at those higher energies. So you have a hard time getting statistics and you get uh, a fairly uh, unfavorable background to signal ratio at those energies. Um, so this was approached with the dance detector by making both uh, thin and thick uranium sample measurements. So you got uh, um, sort of the, the statistics from the thicker measurements and then the details uh, from the thinner sample. And by combining those two measurements, we were able to get down to uncertainties of uh, a few percent in some of the relevant energy regions as compared to the 30% uh, percent uncertainties that was there before. So that was Marion Yendel who was leading that work and, and he has a publication on the uranium-5 results. So with the success of those measurements, um, we continued on plutonium-239 and um, investigated the same energy region uh, Shay Mosby is a, a new staff member at Los Alamos who did some work on that. Um, I think these results are not, have now been finalized. So I have the preliminary result from about a year ago. Um, but really, uh, what the success here was that they extended the energy range out to sort of half an MeV or so, where they got um, good neutron capture data. Um, and again, this was only possible by doing the thin and thick uh, sample measurements and extend that energy range. So, I, so this, the data up to, to 1 kV was published as a year ago, and I think they are now either submitted or have published the um, results going up to the higher um, energies. All right, and then I was going to go and talk about a little bit about a topic that is not actually nuclear data, but just a, um, a program we have at, at the uh, WNR facility that is kind of cool, and uh, it's another use of the neutron beam. So I just have a couple of slide on, slides on that. So you might be aware of the fact that neutrons can damage or have an impact on semiconductor devices. Um, so as you make, as cosmic radiation hits our atmosphere, you're producing high energy neutrons, and those neutrons can penetrate um, down into the atmosphere to uh, flight altitudes and even to uh, sea level altitudes. Um, and those neutrons in turn can interact with semiconductor devices, make charged particles, and cause uh, um, a single event upset uh, in, in electronics. It turns out that one of the flight paths at the WNR facility has a neutron spectrum that is very similar to what you see at flying altitudes. So if you go um, to the different flight path at WNR and depending on which angle you're at relative to the proton beam, you get a slightly different neutron spectrum. So if you go to 30 degrees, uh, you get something that is very similar to what you see uh, uh, up in the atmosphere. So industry and, and different university users 
come to WNR and put their electronics in the beam and just study the effects of the neutron beam um, on their electronics. Um, so again, so these are uh, so-called single event uh, effects that cause this uh, failure in electronics. So what happens is that these high-energy neutrons uh, hit uh, the semiconductor, uh, produce charged uh, particles, and you get a charge deposited in the cell, and you can have a switch from a zero to one or one to zero. Um, it turns out that the aviation industry is kind of concerned about this if their computers fail uh, as you're um, in flight. That can be a serious issue. Of course, most of the electronics is self-correcting, but at least you want to know sort of how common uh, these failures are. So what you see over here is um, the, so in blue you have a measurement of uh, the neutron spectrum, in this case um, at Los Alamos altitude, so not at sea level, but at um, 3,000 or 3,000 meters uh, above sea level compared to the neutron spectrum at, at the WNR facility. And as you can see, they're very close. It's just a, um, they're much more intensity in the neutron beam, of course. So you can test the failure in electronics much faster than if you just put it outside and, and count the, the uh, failures. Um, anyway, so, um, so the, some of the first experiments were done by the Boeing company to investigate this effect on their electronics and airplanes. But since then, there's been many uh, different companies, Intel, AMD, and others that come and do uh, testing at Los Alamos. Um, there, have, there are some examples where uh, single event ups upsets actually caused issues in industry. There's uh, been one uh, incident with an airplane where it lost altitude and they think it had to do with a single event upset, although that's kind of hard to prove. Um, they've also seen um, some high, um, high power, uh, power supply devices that have had problems because of the uh, impact of uh, neutrons. So um, there's a lot of interest, interest from industry to test these effects. All right. So my last topic is going to be on neutron-induced charged particle production measurements, and that's in a different presentation here. Anyone who's good at PDF presentation? Here?
hast du da? Ja, da gibt es die Presentation View und PDF das wohl. Put on full screen mode, yes. No, no. Well, view is that the page display. Is not can wait, no sweat. Nothing is shown. No, yeah. no. Yeah. What is this? Can we reconnect it again? This one? Yeah. See if a this is here, no? Restart it. Probably you restart and then. This means. You restart it, probably. It's showing here, but it's not able to be uploaded. Hmm. Restart what you mean? Frederick, mm -hmm. another option memory stick, mm -hmm. and you run from another computer sure. without uploading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just I, yeah, okay. One minute, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. So the last topic is uh, uh, N-alpha or N-charged particle light reaction uh, measurements. This is a project uh, that with the PI is Hei Yang Li uh, in my group. Um, so she's been uh, developing this new capability as part of an early career grant um, to build an instrument that allows her to do uh, N-charged particle reactions, uh, mainly for nuclear astrophysics, but also for uh, reactor applications. Um, 
Okay, so, um, so as I mentioned, this is a new capability for measuring NC reactions um, that Heyang is developing. Uh, it's the so-called uh, lens detector for low energy NC, not CN, capability. And there's some different reactions that uh, she wants to measure, and uh, currently she's focusing on the oxygen and alpha reaction. Um, so why is that reaction important? Well, there's some, some different reasons. Um, when you do d data testing in solution criticals, um, there's a lot of water around, so uh, plenty of oxygen, and you need to know the uh, N-alpha reaction. Um, there's some interest for naval reactors, and then as well as for some other uh, radiobiology and other uh, interests. Turns out that there has been um, a large change in the evaluation of this reaction very recently. So um, the um, re actually the evaluation that Jerry Hale did changed by something like 30 or 50 percent uh, in a, one of the higher energy regions. So um, there were different measurements supporting both the higher and, and lower values. So there was interest in remeasuring this um, to really study. Uh, or try to confirm one of the evaluations. Um, so there's a measurement uh, at the IRMM in Gale, uh, as well as IPPE, which I don't actually know what that is. Uh, ah, in Russia, okay. So these are the two measurements that give uh, significantly different uh, results in a fairly uh, narrow energy range there. This is a discrepancy that we want to, want to be addressing. Um, so one of the difficulties in setting up the experiment is um, you want to have a pretty low um, sensitivity to low energy particles. So there was uh, some thoughts of, of using the TPC, for example, for end charge particle reactions. Um, we are currently using the TPC for fission measurements, so that wasn't really feasible. So Hei Yang looked at designing in a, a different uh, ionization chamber to do uh, NC. So that's the lens um, chamber. So it uses, a, it's kind of like a fresh gridded ionization chamber. Uh, it has a multi-target wheel system to look at different reactions as well as the uh, reference reaction. And then in the forward angles, he has a silicon strip detector or a set of the silicon strip detectors to measure charged particles. And the whole system uh, is based on wave-forward uh, digitizers, which we do for most of our experiments recently. So this is sort of the setup. So you can see the, um, the multi-target wheel there. Um, back there. And then you have the ionization chamber part with fish grids, anode, cathode. Uh, and then here are the silicon strip detectors for charged particle detection in the forward uh, system. So this was sort of developed over the last few years as part of a, uh, an early career grant. And uh, it's actually right now taking data on oxygen uh, and alpha. So this experiment started a couple of weeks ago uh, out at LANS. So there was some work done with other reactions to commission the detector. So, uh, um, and here's some example of the data that was collected, different resonances. Um, uh, energy resolution, um, I don't know as much to say. So in, in the uh, MEV region uh, at WNR, you get really high energy resolution. So uh, that's not really a, a limitation in the measurements. Um, here are some of the targets that was made, the oxygen targets. Um, tantalum backing. And yeah, so the um, so the feasibility of a study was done, and right now we're actually taking data. So hopefully we will see um, some results in the next few weeks or so. Um, and this is work done with. So Hei Yang is the lead on this, but uh, Shay Mosby and Bob Haight are also involved. Uh, and um, there should be some uh, publication on the uh, nuclear instrument publication on the instrument fairly coming out fairly soon. So, all right. So that's uh, all I had. So I'll take questions.